six. Rain filled the gutters and splashed knee high off the sidewalk. Big cops and slickers that shone like gun barrels had a lot of fun carrying giggling girls across the bad places. The rain drummed hard on the roof of the car and the bird bank top began to leak. A pool of water formed on the floorboards for me to keep my feet in. It was too early in the fall for that kind of rain. I struggled into a trench coat and made a dash for the nearest drugstore and bought myself a pint of whiskey. Back in the car, I used enough of it to keep warm and interested. I was long over part, but the cops were too busy carrying girls and blowing whistles to bother about that. In spite of the rain, or perhaps even because of it, there was business done at Geiger's. Very nice cars stopped in front, and very nice looking people went in and out with wrapped parcels. They were not all men. He showed about four o'clock. A cream-colored coupe stopped in front of the store and I caught a glimpse of the fat face with the Charlie Chan mustache as he dodged out of it and into the store. He was hatless and wore a belted green leather raincoat. I couldn't see his glass eye at that distance. A tall and very good-looking kid in a jerkin came out of the store and rolled the coupe off around the corner and came back walking. His glistening black hair plastered with rain. Another hour went by. It got dark and the rain-clouded light of the stores was soaked up by the black street. Streetcar bells jangled crossly. At about 5.15, the tall boy in a jerkin came out of Geiger's with an umbrella and went after a cream-colored coupe. When he had it in front, Geiger came out and the tall boy held the umbrella for Geiger's bare head. He folded it, shook it off, and handed it into the car. He dashed back into the stores. I started my motor. The coup went west on the boulevard, which forced me to make a left turn and a lot of enemies, including a motorman who stuck his head out into the rain to bowl me out. I was two blocks behind the coup before I got in the groove. I hoped Guy was in his way home. I caught sight of him two or three times and then made him turning north into Laurel Canyon Drive. Halfway up the grade, he turned left and took a curving ribbon of wet concrete, which was called Laverne Terrace. It was narrow street with a high bank on one side and a scattering of cabin-like houses built down the slope of the other side so that their roofs were not very much above road level. Their front windows were masked by hedges and shrubs. Sodden trees dripped all over the landscape. Geiger had his lights on and I hadn't. I speeded up and passed him on a curve, picked a number off a house as I went by and turned at the end of the block. He had already stopped. His car lights were tilted in the garage of a small house with a square box head so arranged that it masked the front door completely. I watched him come out of the garage with his umbrella up and go in through the hedge. He didn't act as if he expected anybody to be tailing him. Light went on in the house. I drifted down to the next house above it, which seemed empty but had no signs out. I parked, aired out the convertible, and drank from my bottle and sat. I didn't know what I was waiting for, but something told me to wait. Another army of sluggish minutes dragged by. Two cars came up the hill and went over the crest. It seemed to be a very quiet street. At a little after six, more bright lights bobbed through the driving rain. It was pitch black by then. A car dragged to stop in front of Geiger's house. The filaments of its lights glowed dimly and died. The door opened and a woman got out. A small, slim woman in a Vega Bond hat and a transparent raincoat. She went in through the box maze. A bell rang faintly, light through the rain, a closing door, silence. I reached the flash out of my car pocket and went down grade and looked at the car. It was a pack of convertible, maroon and dark brown. The left window was down. I felt for the license holder and poked light at it. The registration read Carmen Sternwood, 3765 Alta Brea Crescent, West Hollywood. I went back to my car again and sat and sat. The top dripped on my knees and my stomach burned from the whiskey. No more cars came up the hill. No lights went on in the house before which I was parked. It seemed like a nice neighborhood to have bad habits in. At 7.20, a single flash of hard white light shot out of Geiger's house like a wave of summer lightning. As the darkness folded back on it and ate it up, a thin, tinkling scream echoed out and lost itself among the rain-drenched trees. 
I was out of the car on my way before the echoes died. There was no fear in the scream. It had a sound of half-pleasurable shock, an accent of drunkenness, an overtone of pure idiocy. It was a nasty sound. It made me think of men in white and barred windows and hard, narrow cots with leather wrists and ankle straps fastened to them. The Geiger hideout was perfectly silent again. When I hit the gap in the hedge and dodged down the angle that masked the front door, there was an iron ring in the lion's mouth for Naka. I reached for it. I had a hold of it. At that exact instant, as if somebody had been waiting for the cue, three shots boomed in the house. There was a sound that might have been a long, harsh sigh, then a soft, messy thump, and then rapid footsteps in the house going away. The door fronted on the narrow run like a footbridge over a gully that filled the gap between the house wall and the edge of the bank. There was no porch, no solid ground, no way to get around it to the back. The back entrance was at the top of a flight of wooden steps that rose from the alley-like street below. I knew this because I heard a clatter of feet on the steps going down. Then I heard the sudden roar of a starting car. It faded swiftly into the distance. I thought the sound was echoed by another car, but I wasn't sure. The house in front of me was as silent as a vault. There wasn't any hurry. What was there was in there. I straddled the fence at the side of the runway and leaned far out to the draped but unscreened French window and tried to look in at the crack where the drapes came together. I saw a lamplight on a wall and one end of a bookcase. I got back on the runway and took all of it and some of the hedge and gave the front door the heavy shoulder. This was foolish. About the only part of the California house you can't put your foot through is the front door. All it did was hurt my shoulder and make me mad. I climbed over the railing again and kicked the French window in, used my hat for a glove and pulled out most of the lower small pane of glass. I could now reach in and draw a bolt that fastened the window to the sill. The rest was easy. There was no top bolt. The catch gave. I climbed in and pulled the drapes off my face. Neither of the two people in the room paid any attention to the way I came in although only one of them was dead.